will now move on to uh, ben Vanis, uh discussions of the axis. And if you recall, the axis is the uh, pointing to pointing to something, uh, the showing of something, the actics, the axis. In his book uh, of in his work of 1953, the animal communication and human language work of 1953. He demonstrated that, Ben Venice demonstrated that the language of humans, human speech, is not reducible to that of the uh, uh, type which we find in animals, in bees and in dogs and in monkeys and in cats and everything. In uh, animals, he says, that it's quite a stimulus response system, but in humans it's not. And we cannot reduce human language to that kind of system as B.F. Skinner did. You know, it's not behaviorist. Uh, we should not become reductionist in that way. Language is rather a negotiation, a building. It becomes a discursive act, a discursive act. Whatever discursive means, we will discuss that and discuss the um, James G. Uh, notions of discourse, the Foucaultian notions of discourse, the Eleanor Ox and Bambley Shefflin the notions of discourse, and so forth. So, in this work, he repudiated the behaviorist linguistic interpretations. And how did he do this? Well, first of all, he took the notion of I and you, the pronouns I and you, and the polarity between I and you. And he told us that uh, there is a, uh, when we speak about the, uh, or when we refer to a third person, he, she, or him, her, that, they, then when we use a third person pronoun, the third person acts under certain conditions, and these conditions are a possibility of having an IU polarity. So meaning that the third person cannot exist unless, unless there is a, an I and you, the first and second persons. So without there being an I and you present, there cannot be a third person. And he said that, well, narration and description frequently, if not always, illustrate this fact that to have a third person, we need to have an I and a you. And without the I and you, there cannot be a, a her or him or she or he or they. So hence the I, the I pronoun, signifies a person uttering the present instance of a discourse containing the I. So I means I, who is here. However, if I say the word simply I, and I'm not meaning I, I just say the word I, then it will not have an effect. And this was his argument against the stimulus response idea, because if a, a, a person says the word I and doesn't mean the I, then there's going to be uh, a response to the I. However, if the person, uh, if we look at the behaviorist version of this, um, you know, of speech, but if we look at the non-post behaviorist version of speech, the discursive version of speech, then we need to do more than say I, because I represents I in this instance. And if my friend says I, then it changes. If I say she or he, it means something different to um, she or he said by my friend when they refer to me. So the um, version of I, she, he, you, always changes. And it's never the same. So depending on who says it, how they say it, the context within which it is being said, then uh, the discourse uh, molds itself. So the, the discourse molds itself around the center of usage of these uh, diactic forms of pronoun, or these pronoun, pronoun forms of diactic. Okay, and that was Ben Venice's uh, uh, argument for the importance of pronouns and how they um, refute um, the then uh, current conceptions of speech, the behaviorist conceptions of speech. So Ben Venice tells us that I, the letter I, or I, can only be identified, 
I can only be identified by the instance of discourse that contains this I and by that alone. So if I say I, then we have to look at the, the instance of discourse. Say I am a big person. So well, mm, who's saying that? Are you actually saying this about yourself or are you um, uh, reading this? Maybe a book by Robert Louis Stevenson or <clears throat> Charles Dickens um, writing about one of their characters or something. So if you're reading a book written by R.L. Stevenson and um, speaking about one of the characters, then that cannot be you. So I, what does this mean? Where is the center of reference? Okay, so it's not a simple um, stimulus response system. It has to be something else. So hence Benvenist describes and defines the second person, the you, uh, by by telling us that by introducing, and I quote, by introducing the situation of address, by addressing, by introducing the situation of address, we obtain a symmetrical definition for you as the individual spoken to in the present instance of discourse containing the linguistic instance of you. So these definitions refer to I, I, the I, the I, and you as a category of language, as a linguistic category. And these are related to their position in language. So this consciousness then emerges from uh, the awareness of language and the ways in which language instigates or affects some sort of awareness in the person and by the person. And in his book, in his uh, works, the sub subjectivity in language and the nature of pronouns, collected in his um, uh, major work, the Problems de Linguistique Générale, Problems de Linguistique Générale, he aimed to uh, describe signs and you know, how they affect change in the human and how they allow human subjects or facilitate in the human subject a sort of reference to self or how they assist human subjects to reference selves and to create parameters of human self-consciousness. Okay, so by saying I, I suddenly become aware of you and they, she, he. By saying you, I become aware of I. So this becomes very Saussurian in the sense that to actually uh, get, to signify, to signify the uh, first person or second person or third person, we have to signify each of the other, first, second, or third. So if I want to signify I, I must definitely signify you and she in a certain way. If I want to signify you, I must uh, uh, simultaneously signify I and she. And if I um, want to signify or um, realize she, he, they, I definitely, definitely must um, create a, 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 some sort of um, significated or signified representation of I and you, because without I and you, there can be no she or he. And so this is what Benvenis is telling us in the idea that um, to describe signs uh, and allowing the human, human subjects to reference selves, then we must create certain parameters of human self-consciousness. And this is what happens through the excess. So uh, the ego is the person who says ego, according to Benvenis. Uh, if I say ego, ego, then this means the ego. And if you remember that in Greek, the ego is not a noun. It's not a pronoun. It is rather um, a, a verb. Okay, a verb. A verb, the I is not a static I, not a stasis, but a kinesis. Always emerging, always becoming. Okay, so the ego, the I, according to Ben Benist, it thus emerges... Um, into a sort of a foundation of subjectivity uh, determined by the linguistic status of the person. And you could be the person speaking or the person hearing about the person speaking and referring to you or the person um, not he being there at present and hearing about it or being spoken about or something. Okay. So this then merges, emerges and um, develops into forms 
a sort of a consciousness of self, which is only possible if uh, it's experienced by a uh, contrast of sorts. So if you're I, then you realize I because you're speaking about you, speaking about she, he. If you're you, then you only realize you because you're being spoken to by I and so forth. So I use I only when I speak to somebody to um, uh, whom I label as you. I cannot speak about I unless I'm speaking to someone who is a you. I cannot speak about you unless I'm speaking about I. And this version of Benvenist's behaviorist stimulus response repudiation then evolved into his discussions of annonce and annunciation. And more so, this emerged from his discussions and work on pronouns. And he spoke about these two words, the annonce and annunciation. And he told us that the annonce, the annonce, is a statement independent of context. It is a simple stimulus response language. It's I, irrespective of who the I is. And there is a certain response that you will get every time you hear the word I. You say I, well I just means um, I. And you just means you. However, annunciation, according to Ben Bernist, becomes the act of stating as tied to context. So this becomes very contextual language. Annonce and annunciation. So this distinction between annonce and annunciation moved Benvenist to see language as a discursive instance. And the idea of using pronouns to refer to a changing nature of discourse is uh, the way in which Benvenist uh, positioned his argument so to um, argue that we must see language in a non-behaviorist way. So that is fundamentally as discourse. This discourse, in turn, is, according to Benvenist, an actual utilization of language, and it is its very enactment in a cosmological way. So what is the exist then? The exist then is the following. We have our pronoun I, I, and I is a linguistic sign. When we use the word I, it becomes a sign. So if we say I, I doctor, then of course we see I in a different way. So somebody says I, think what are they talking about? I, 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 I. I is the letter which comes after H and prior to J. So, oh, okay, I'm talking about the alphabet. So I get it now. I watch Sesame Street. If they say I, doctor, where are you? Then we know they're referring to the I doctor. But if they say I, captain, then they're saying, oh, I see, I, yes, captain. However, if they say I am here now, then you know that they're referring to themselves. It's a reflexive, reflexive use of pronoun, and they're speaking to somebody else. If there's an I, there must be a U. There cannot be an I without a U. Uh, even if the I is the same person, they're speaking to themselves. And the I is employable by the whole linguistic community, of course, because I is, you know, is conventional and understandable by everybody. But it cannot begin to represent the fullness of one human being's self-consciousness. It cannot. I is only a word. It is only a word. Okay? Um, and it's only a word because until it becomes contextualized, it is only a word. So due to its relational importance as a linguistic sign, so when it becomes a sign, it is definitely uh, has relational importance, the person has a certain propensity, propensity to employ I as representational. So then we start to see the post-structural, and we haven't discussed structuralism nor post-structuralism yet, which we will do, but in this way we begin to see the post-structural effects of I and you know, the positionality of the noun or the artifact, which becomes a sign. 
sein. So I quote Benvenis then, as he says that it is in and through language that man constructs himself as a subject. Because language alone establishes the concept of ego in reality, in its reality, which is that of being. It is in and through language that man constructs himself as a subject. Because language alone establishes the concept of ego in reality, in its reality, which is that of being. So it is through language and the use of language that the person establishes themselves in a certain reality. So until the language is used in context, then the reality, the reality, the reality, relevant to the context, has not emerged. So through the use of language, I, you, and in this case, uh, deictics, a certain reality through language becomes, becomes. So when we separate the I and the you in a dialogue, this becomes crucial to categorize the persons. Okay, the persons uh, become signified by, and their roles in the discursive act become signified, enacted, manifested and realized by uh, separating the I and you. Okay. I become the person who is speaking and you are the receiver. But if you start speaking, then you cease to be a you and you then become the I and I become the you. So it, this positions the individual subjects in a discursive act. So then Benvenis tells us that the personal pronouns are significant for speaker appropriation in the discursive act and Dexis becomes a strategy for speaker appropriation. So what does this mean? This means that um, the meaning, the meaning itself is only realized with reference to a certain instance of discourse in which the dialectic category appears. And this was uh, Benvenis' main argument in his, um, or central argument in his discussion of dialectics and the pronouns and his repudiation of the old uh, active, passive, stimulus, response, behaviorist notion of language. So in this way, and this is what we will discuss a little later, today in our um, work on the linguistic anthropology of Benvenist, this also employs or creates a person's spatiotemporal designation. And the spatiotemporal and social aspects, we put together and we call that, we put that all together and we uh, subsume it under the category of cosmological. Okay. So then, going back to Benvenist's notion of dexis, uh, we ask a question. How does, how does the reference to extra-linguistic social realities manifest within discursive enunciation? And Benvenist has a solution for this. He says that, well, in enunciation, in the enunciation, and I quote, in the enunciation, language finds itself employed for the expression of a certain relation to the world as we saw in the dialectics, I, you, and which also uh, arises in the use of spatial dialectics, here, there, or temporal, now, then, tomorrow, yesterday. So Benvenist, in this way, Benvenist describes a relation to the world which, as expressed, as expressed, as the speaker expresses, assumes form of a linguistic fact. It becomes a linguistic fact because I am stating that fact. Okay, and you know, uh, factual language and performative and everything, we will speak about that when we look at uh, um, Austin and so forth. Okay, so hence there emerges a problem of relation, which I call problem of relation, that language maintains with the world because the uh, language must maintain a certain relationship with the world for you know, language to become contextualized uh, cosmologically, cosmologically. And this becomes located in the centers of expression 
according to Benvenist, not in the sphere of that expressed. Okay, so it becomes located in the centers of expression, the person who expresses, and not in the whole sphere. Okay, it becomes quite tailored to who is doing the expression, not everything together. So then this really becomes a linguistic anthropology because we look at how the person actually situates, situates themselves so to realize the, um, rea to realize the world uh, discursively. Okay, this is linguistic anthropology. The action of the individual to um, create a certain linguistic reality. Okay. A discursive reality, a discursive reality. This is a discursive reality. The actions of the person, the agent, to form a certain linguistic reality, or reality through language. And I quote, uh, the presence of the speaker at his enunciation renders each instance of discourse constitutive of an internal center of reference, and this is the way that Benvenist actually represented his ideas in using deictics uh, to uh, assign agency to the individual to construct, reconstruct the world around them through language. So every time the speaker speaks, then the, uh, uh, the discourse constitutes an internal center of reference and um, this puts the speaker and the listener and others who are not present uh, in such a position so as to uh, become actors in a certain uh, relative way, okay, discursively. So to contextualize this and to conceptualize this, the idea of I is strictly bound to a singular center of expression. It is strictly bound to a singular center of expression that others the I at a specific point in time. So remember, we're looking at the temporal scales, the social scales, the spatial scales, and hence the cosmological scales. Okay, so the I is bound very strictly to a center, a center of expression. Okay, and this center of expression is doing the acting at any time. There's a certain active performance. So Benvenus then stresses the role of pronouns and uh, spatial and temporal markers in diaxis. He tells us that, well, there isn't just the one group. All of these actually work together to contour our discourse and our context and uh, to contour the ways in which we set up a reality of the world. Through I, through the I, whatever I means, I is the reflexive description of uh, the person speaking. Then there is a provision of an inner reference, inner reference. An inner reference how? An inner reference to the discourse, an inner reference psychologically, this ugly word again, which manifests the presence of the speaker at his enunciation, says Benvenist. Which manifests the presence of the speaker at his enunciation. That is the relationship of the linguistic given and non-linguistic center of speech, which is I. The relationship is significant for positioning not only me, but also the others around me, the you and the they and the she and the he. Meaning that the center is irreducible to a linguistic given. Okay, it's irreducible to a linguistic given, but refers to the linguistic capability in the enunciation expressed and that which expresses itself. Okay. All right. So, so now quickly going back to these three sets of uh, markers, diectic markers, the uh, pronoun um, diectics, the you and the I and the he and the she and the they and everything, the spatial, the here and there, and the temple, the now and uh, before and tomorrow and afterwards and everything. Uh, represent the centers of expression, of course, as we've been saying over the past five minutes, and are dialogical and situated in the world, and we will speak about how they're dialogical later on when we, in a little, when we look at the linguistic anthropology of um, these um, markers. However, the dialogical nature 
we've also spoken about before, in that they, to get a, uh, and to get a Bactinian, Bactinian perspective on these, to get a, a context for I, we need to um, also look at you. And there, is, there can be no I without you, there can be no you without I, there can be no she, he without I and you. Okay. All right. So uh, it's very important to, to note that these uh, words, these um, pronouns and uh, spatial and temporal markers uh, solicit possibilities of co-reference. So there's a co-reference. So uh, while I'm referencing myself, I'm also referencing you and she and he and everything. And of course, relevant to communication. So how then does this notion of the excess actually culminate in uh, Benveniste's argument away from, or argument against, the uh, behave very behaviorist uh, stimulus response um, work that was done before him? Well, we, Benveniste tells us that we must rethink complex situations between singular social experiences where speakers and their enunciations become situated and static forms of expressions without reducing the forms of expression prematurely. And in a totalizing approach to ideological formations or counterformations. So here we're being told that the, the relationship between the very static annonce and the very dynamic annunciation isn't as simple as we think. There is never an annonce without an annunciation, and there is never an annunciation without the annonce. So there is never a long without pahol, and there is never a long and pahol without langage. This very static form of speech is always applied in a certain way. So we cannot have the, um, uh, the syntactic signification without the semantic signification, and vice versa. So the dancer does not become a dancer until the dancer dances. And in the Duranti version of um, uh, speech community, the speech community does not become a speech community until they begin to speak, and only then does the speech community arise. Otherwise, there is no speech community. The speech community is dormant, so to speak. There is a dormancy. And then when the speech community begins to speak in a certain way, then the speech community arises, and it becomes a community of practice. That which is expressed in the expression is identified with the inner reference by virtue of which the centers of expression, the speakers, appropriate speech and manifest themselves in this speech and at the same time manifest others in that speech by reference, through reference.